right. Wow, that worked. Uh, yeah. So, uh, welcome back. We are in John chapter 1. We're ready to start uh, verse 29. Verse 29. This is still during the ministry of John the Baptist. So last week we discussed a little bit about the identity of John the Baptist, namely, he's not the Christ, but what he is, he's the voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. So let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together this morning in your name. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, uh, to take on our sin, to bear it away from us. To, we thank you for sending your spirit, by which we're made wise unto salvation, by which we are born of you, and by which uh, we then are, are empowered to tell others to come and see. Bless us now as we, as we look in the scriptures, as we read them, that we may hear the voice of your son, and in him gain wisdom and eternal life in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I just want to look at verse 29 for a bit. We'll, we'll probably get beyond verse 29 today, but we're going we're gonna to hover there, and I'm not, I'm not apologizing for it. <clears throat> the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this is as John is preaching, John the Baptist. <clears throat> now, why do we call him a Baptist? He's, he baptizes, right? I know there have been attempts to call him John the Baptizer so that he's not confused with the Baptist church, but that that does a great disservice to my English language. Baptizer is just grating on the ears. Just so, but just so we understand what, we, what he means here, John the Baptist does not mean he believes in like soul accountability and credo baptism and all of that. It means that his job is to baptize. As a matter of fact, today we're going to see that John the Baptist is quite Lutheran. He would recognize our teachings as genuine. Like, I, that's what you call it. Um, now, he's, <clears throat> he's been preaching, although in John, uh, in, in, in John's gospel, we don't hear a lot of his preaching. Just the one sermon. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is not made clear in the text, but it is kind of an inference that Jesus has been coming to John maybe for a bit. That, that is, that Jesus has been among the crowds, especially as, as the crowd comes from Jerusalem, from the Pharisees, <clears throat> and, and he says, there's one among you you don't even know. And then as, as, as John is preaching, he points out Jesus, and from that moment, from the moment that John points out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John will begin to decrease, Jesus will begin to increase. I mean, he'll, he'll say as much in, in one of the other Gospels. But, there is a matter of chronology here. In John's Gospel, and we talked about this when we looked at the overview, John does not necessarily present everything in chronological order. And there will sometimes be passages of time that are long that are just not accounted for in John. And here, we have a couple of things that are assumed to have happened. They must have happened already. But John doesn't address them in the gospel. And that is the baptism of Jesus itself. And then, of course, what happens immediately at the end of his baptism Temptation in the wilderness, right? He's led out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. <clears throat> that has happened prior to, to verse 29. <clears throat> um, 
So Jesus is coming toward him. And John... Now, does John the Baptist know about Jesus' baptism? Would he have been told about it? He did it. Right, yeah. He, <clears throat> sometimes they are trick questions. Um, yeah, yeah, he, he did it. As a matter of fact, John was a little hesitant. Wait, I, I need to be baptized by you, but you come to me? It's, it's a logical hesitation. But Jesus says it's necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus gets into the water, shoulder to shoulder with mankind, with sinful man. <clears throat> he gets in the water not, be, not because he has sins to be washed away, but he's standing there with us. He's with us in the flesh. And then, of course, of course the voice from heaven calls down, this is my beloved son. So now when John points out the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John heard that directly from the Father. So John is bearing witness to what he has seen, which is exactly what we heard about earlier. <clears throat> John will say later that he didn't, he didn't recognize Jesus. <clears throat> now, John is a cousin of Jesus. So he, he, he knows the man, Jesus of Nazareth. He knows Jesus, the son of Joseph. But it required the Father, it required the Father to reveal to him that he is, in fact, the Son of God. So, he's bearing witness to what he's seen. This is my beloved Son. And he points out to his crowds, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes. Well, John's going to say later he didn't recognize him. I know. I know. <laughs> I think that every time I come across that text, when John baptized, what did he say? The, the question is, uh, what did John say when John baptized the people that were coming out? Yes, it, it was going to involve repentance somehow, right? It, it was not... It was not right. It was not Christian baptism. Probably. <laughs> it, well, it, was, it, was, it was preparatory. Well, that'd be circumcised to be a Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there were many baptisms that were going on because there was kind of a... There's certain times in history where you can feel things culminating and, and there is kind of an apocalyptic air if you don't recognize it now, I can't help you. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, at, at this time, there, were, there was interest in these mystery writings. There were all this discussion of angels and prophecy. People were out in the wilderness baptizing. John wasn't the only one. But John's message was very consistent. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, then he, well, right. He, he'd wash them. That's the synoptics, though. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, right, right. Yeah, John's message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And in the synoptics, Jesus' first message is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. There's not daylight between John and Jesus. So, there's much to discuss. First of all, John calls him the Lamb of God. It is beautifully poetic. There's just no two ways about that. And there's all kind of uh, hymnody, poetry, uh, art that has been dedicated to this very concept, right? Lamb of God, pure and holy, who... On the cross didst suffer. Right, so this, this concept is very central to the proclamation of Christ, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we'll summarize Genesis 22. You know the story well, right? Genesis 22 is the account of 
the sacrifice of Isaac, right? Or the near sacrifice of Isaac, or the binding of Isaac, right? However you want to put it, where the Lord tells Abraham, you know, Abraham had to wait years and years and years for his miracle son. He finally gets him. Here's Isaac. Isaac is, is a happy, obedient son. And then God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, take him up the mountain and sacrifice him. And so Abraham tells his men, you know, we're going to go up there and we're going to come back. He takes Isaac up the mountain. He, puts, he places the wood on his back. They walk up the mountain. Um, Abraham lays him on the altar made of wood. And he's going to sacrifice his only son at which point the angel stays his hand and says, no, right? Now notice the important nature of his sacrifice is that it was voluntary. God commands and Abraham obeys. As a matter of fact, not only is it voluntary on the, the part of Abraham, Isaac Isaac is pretty willing himself, and he's described in the text as being old enough to understand. He's, he's, not, he's not a little toddler. He's, he's a lad, you know. He's a teenager, maybe a young adult. Um, what does Abraham say then? God himself. God himself will provide the sacrifice. And there was a ram with his horn caught in the thicket, right? So Abraham makes this, this statement that God himself will provide the lamb for a sacrifice. Now, sacrificing lambs, of course, uh, would not be a unique concept just to Abraham. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Mm. All right, Exodus chapter 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but... The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons According to what each can eat, you shall make your, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the blood is a sign. It's a sign for Israel, right? It's going to be a sign for them on the houses where they are. But it's also going to be a sign for the angel to say, pass over this house. Do not strike this house. That is to say, the firstborn of, e of Israel are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, are they saved by red paint that symbolizes the blood? No. They are not saved by symbols of the blood. They are saved by the blood of the lamb. A male lamb, young, without blemish. Why is that important? Why is it important that the, that the, that the lamb be male and without blemish? 
It's pointing to Jesus. Yeah, it's going to come from among you. Right. Christ is made man. He's going to come from the tribe of Judah, but he's going to be one of us. He's going to be man. Yeah, yeah, this is the hymn appointed for Easter. This is the chief hymn for the chief uh, festival on Easter day. This is, uh, this is the fifth stanza in our hymnal. Here our true Paschal Lamb we see, whom God so freely gave us. He died on the accursed tree, so strong his love to save us. See, his blood now marks our door. Faith points to it, death passes o'er, and Satan cannot harm us. Hallelujah. Yeah, making the, the, the point explicitly, the Paschal Lamb is fulfilled. Y'all. It's like being 13 all over again. So... <laughs> You're going to have to wait for the encore. That's right. Turn to Isaiah 53. Yep. Could you imagine teaching this class and just me going blah, 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 and everyone just kind of sitting there like... Again, this is prophecy of the suffering servant of God. Written, of course, about 800 years before Christ is born. Uh, but this is what it says. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have turned, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So here, I mean, if you don't know what this is describing, don't skip church on Good Friday, please. <laughs> right. It, you, you can't help but be hit by this. Yeah, so here's a description, of course, of the suffering, the passion, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. Not only the facts of it, but the importance, right? Why? One, it was the will of the Father. And two, it was for us. It was because of our sins, but also for our healing. By his stripes we are healed. Now look, look at, oh, there it is, verse 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Right? Yeah. And um, to bear the sins means what? 
to take them on, although they are not his. It's not that he's committing sin. To accuse Jesus of sin is blasphemy. It is literally blasphemy. There are theologians that have done this. Um, some of them write for CPH volumes. There are Lutherans that do it. Right. <clears throat> yeah, be very careful what, what you take in. But to, to bear the sin means he didn't commit his own sin. It means he's taking the sin on and taking the sin away. Right. Lastly, turn to Exodus chapter 29. Ironically, Muslims will say nicer things about Jesus than liberals. Because, because Muslims would not generally call Jesus a sinner. But liberal theologians might. Exodus 29. We're not going to read all of this. This has a lot to do with um, the priests. But then, look at verse 15. Then you shall take one of the rams, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram and take its blood and throw it against the sides of the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into pieces and wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and its head, and burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a pleasing aroma a food offering to the Lord. Now turn to verse 38. Remember here, what, what's happening is a description of how, how worship is going to go in the tabernacle and then eventually in the temple. Verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs, a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb a tenth seah of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hin of beaten oil, and with the fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer with it a grain offering and its drink offering, as in the morning, for a pleasing aroma of food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me in the priests, or serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the priests are going to be offering sacrifices twice daily. There are lots of others in addition to this. But twice daily, there's going to be a, a young lamb taken, one offered in the morning, one offered at twilight, every day over and over and over again, right? But there's going to be a lamb that's going to be the, the, the culmination and the end of, of all of that sacrifice. The end, not because God says, well, uh, I'm doing away with that now because I'm doing something different. It's rather that the end is in the end of the race. It's the fulfillment. Right? Yeah. Right. It's, 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 it's pointing forward to something coming, which in Christ has now come. Notice, John the Baptist does not say, Behold, a Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No, and the way Greek works, it is, it is as definite as it is in English. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just, not just one lamb among many lambs, not just, oh, he's like the lambs of the Old Testament. Well, he is, but he's the Lamb. Right? So, in John, John begins his gospel by the mystery of the Incarnation. The Word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us. John is going to describe Jesus as the Lamb of God. He's also going to describe him as Jesus does himself. The mystery of the incarnation is that the Lamb of God is the Good Shepherd. You know, typically lambs and shepherds occupy different spots in that whole hierarchy of pastures, right? Yeah, so he, he's, he's the shepherd. And there's prophecy about shepherds in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, for example, uh, where the Lord chastises the shepherds of Israel and he says, I'm going to come and be the shepherd. I myself am going to do it. Of course, the 23rd Psalm. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. But he's also the Lamb of God. This word, by the way, for lamb um, is used... In the New Testament, it's only used here and again in verse 36. And this word here simply means lamb. Uh, there's not really any, there's not any connotation of a certain size, just the word lamb. Um, it's also the word used in the Septuagint in Exodus 12 for lamb. Elsewhere, though, in John, we do hear about lambs, especially when Jesus is restoring Peter and Peter says, you know, yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. And Jesus tells him what? Feed my lambs. Now there, the word is, it's related to that same Greek word, lamb of God, but it's a diminutive, right? So many languages have diminutive forms. So like... Um, in Spanish, you might call someone, you know, mi niño, meaning what? My child, my son, right? But you might say mi niñito, meaning what? Little child, right? It's diminutive. Italian has diminutives. Um, uh, Latin has diminutives. German has diminutives. Yes, right? That shen or line, right? You have um, brot, brotchen, right? Bread, little bread. So here, you have the Lamb of God as the Lamb. When Jesus tells Peter, feed my lambs, the word in English, I guess you might translate it lamblet. I, I don't know how, you know, how, how do you make that diminutive, right? L little lambs, right? <laughs> so, Jesus is the Lamb. We are his lambs, right? We are the sheep of his pasture, but we're, we're, we're little, right? In Revelation, the lamb is the, one, the only one who's worthy to open the scroll. But what in Revelation do we know about the lamb? What does the lamb look like? He's been slain. The word there is lamblet. He's one of us. He's been wounded, right? Now, there, there, in, in, uh, in Greek, there is another word that just means sheep, robata, um, and that, that will get translated as sheep. Uh, lamb generally has a connotation of being young, young or youngish. What does John mean then by calling Jesus the Lamb of God? This is, this is always of interest, right, to, to word people because what we call the genitive case or an English possessive case can mean possession, it can mean origin, right? What does John mean by saying that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Right, but in what sense is he of God? He's God's son? Yeah, it's, it's origin, right? Now, he is his son, I mean, I, I guess you can say by possession, kind of, but according, at least according to humiliation. But this is going to be more about his origin, right? He sent from God. Remember, what was the promise that, that Abraham knew? 
God Himself will provide the sacrifice. The sacrifice that God provides is His own Son, Jesus. Right? That's the sense in which He's the Lamb of God. Uh, we know this text really well, though, because we sing it. I, I would say that we sing it once every week, but I don't think that's true. If you're like me, you probably sing it throughout the week sometimes to, your, to yourself. Right? When does the church sing the, the hymn? Um, the hymn is known by the Latin, Agnus Dei. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right as the distribution begins. As the pastor communes and the elders commune and then everyone else comes up. Why do we sing about Christ being the Lamb of God at the beginning of the distribution of the Lord's Supper? Who is he and what's he doing? Yeah. Right. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which is to say, he's among us to forgive our sins. In verse 29, we're still there. It's a good verse. I'll not apologize for dwelling there. Um, <laughs> In verse 29, not only does John the Baptist call, we're back in John 1, by the way, um, not only does John call Jesus the Lamb of God, not just on use day, but on use day qui talit peccata mundi, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin. Careful. You do this in the beginning of church too, by the way, and you don't even know it. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my... <laughs> Everyone else did it right. <laughs> There's always one. Yeah, and, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, does that mean, well, I only committed one sin last week, so like that's all I've got to bring before the Lord? Right. Understand that in John, the word hamartia is used to describe sin. Here, tain hamartia in the accusative case. That word means misses the mark, but it's used in the singular. In other words, it's not just a list of the bad things you've done. That is a very common and pervasive way of looking at, at sin especially if you live in a very Protestant country. But understand that sin is not merely, I mean, it, it is, that's, it's not wrong to speak of it that way. Certainly we do have things that we've done and failed to do, which are, you know, in themselves wrong. But in John, that word refers to, and, and, and you really see this when we get to John 8 and John 9 next year, You'll really see it that <laughs> I'm an optimist. Sin is going to refer to, first of all, the failure to see that Jesus is the light of the world, the, fa the fa failure to recognize him, the failure and the refusal to believe in him, and also opposition to God. Now, are those in any way related to the wicked things that we do? Of course they are. Right. Yes, right. John talks a lot like Moses. Sin entered the world, right? That sin is not just the bad things that you've done, because if that's true, the message of the church might simply be, let me, uh, let me show you how to just stop sinning. Now, John will write in his epistle, I write you these things that you may not sin. In other words, part of Christian preaching is, hey, maybe you should like throw out your phone. Maybe you shouldn't send your kids to that school. Maybe they shouldn't have screens in front of their faces all day. That should be part of the preaching of the church. But ultimately, the goal is not, let me show you how to stop sinning. Because what does John say? I write you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. 
So in John's gospel, sin is going to be described chiefly as singular, as a condition of mankind standing in opposition to God. Spiritual darkness, spiritual death, in need of spiritual rebirth, and opposed to God. So not morally neutral. There's none of that revivalistic, like, well, the devil cast one vote against you, God, vote, or God cast one vote for you, now you've got to break the tie. That was the preaching of some of the revivalist preacher, preachers back in the 19th century. Um, that's not how John describes sin. We are dead, we need rebirth. Um, so, this is the lamb, the singular lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And that's how he stands in distinction with the lamb that you find back in Exodus chapter 12, right? Uh, Luther had a great quote on this. I'm going to read it real quick. Um, he says, in this passage, John virtually chides Moses as if he were saying, you Jews sacrifice a lamb every Passover as Moses commanded you. In addition, you butcher two lambs daily, which are sacrificed and burned each morning and each evening. It is a lamb to be sure, but you Jews make such a display of it, you praise these sacrifices and boast of them so much that you eclipse the glory of God, push God into the background, and deprive him of his honor. One is a lamb procured from the shepherds. The other, however, is an entirely different lamb. It is the lamb of God. Which is why in Hebrews you have a discussion about this is why we don't need the temple anymore. This is why we don't need the sacrifices anymore because this sacrifice has in fact taken away the sin of the world. Now, what does it mean to take away sin? The word here can mean uh, to, to bear or to carry. But understand that to, be, to have the sin taken away is to be set free. Because, how does the Bible describe those who sin? They're slaves to sin. Those who commit sin are slaves to sin. So those who have been washed of their sin, those who have the sin put on Christ, the Lamb of God, he has now been set free from sin. This, yeah, oh, uh, entirely emancipated. This is, this is why antinomianism is such a pernicious error because it denies that Jesus has in fact taken away the sin of the world. It says, I'm going to continue to walk in sin even though I consider myself a Christian. No, our identity is that we've been set free from sin. If we've been set free from sin, we don't walk in it. That doesn't mean that we don't stumble. We will. But there's a huge difference between sins of weakness, brief sins of error that you immediately repent of. And oddly enough, we find out about this in John's epistle versus sin ruling over you, intentionally sinning, right? Right, and liking it. I don't care what God says, I'm going to sin anyway. That's, that's denying that Christ has in fact taken away the sin of the world. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. I'd hate to think your Bible spines are just stuck on one book, you know. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I, I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules." This is a prophecy about the last days. That in the last days, God is going to pour out His Spirit upon His people for the purpose of cleansing them, right? Cleansing them from what? From their idolatry? From their disobedience? But notice, God does not merely cleanse us and then we're back to neutral again. We're, we're you know, our, our slate is clean. He doesn't do that. He, he takes away the old, he takes away the sinful, and gives us a new heart, right? That's the promise. So it's not like 
I'll remove the evil spirits from you and then, you know, best of luck not letting them back in. In order to prevent that from happening, he puts his own spirit within us. It's, it's, this is the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do for us? He points us to Christ. Yeah. He takes what, what belongs to Christ, what Christ has said, and makes it known to us. This is why you can have people who have been presented with the gospel so clearly, and yet they will not believe. Because we need the Holy Spirit. We just need to be born. Right, yeah, we need to be reborn. And that's what's being described here in Ezekiel 36. In the last days, there will be a new birth where the people are cleansed, they're cleansed of idolatry, they're cleansed of their sins, and God puts his spirit within us, and he puts a new heart within us. This is the kind of thing, by the way, that who is supposed to know? Since we're in John's Gospel, Nicodemus is the one who's supposed to know this. Which is why when Jesus starts speaking about this, Jesus is going he's gonna to teach this way, and Nicodemus is going to say, I don't get it. And Jesus is going to get frustrated and says, you're the teacher of Israel. You don't get this? You're supposed to have been watching for all of this. And you're even a Pharisee. You've got Ezekiel in your Bible. Like, you should know this. And, I mean, Jesus, of course, is right. He should have known. He should have recognized. So Jesus explains for him. We'll get that. We'll get to that in chapter three. Next year. <laughs> Maybe. This isn't yeah. right. Thus says sprinkling of water. <laughs> I hadn't thought of this as a mode of baptism text, but yeah. <laughs> Anything else on verse 29? Cool. Next week we'll pick up with verse 30. We're close enough. That's right. Well, I'm sorry, I'll slow down. We'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you. What's funny is I had prepared like halfway through chapter two because I was just sure we were going to fly through this. I was wrong. <laughs>